Hey, enormous. How's it going? Oh. Yeah, I made a mistake on my bloody scheduling of the stream. Put the wrong date on it. <laughs> Might be a bit slow for people to get here. Hope it sorts things out. I don't know. Right. Goka? Goka? I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Hello, how's it going? Max, how's it going? Got new people? I haven't seen you here before. Yes. Just want to make sure things behaving. Seems to be working alright. Oh, I don't know. Put it on a date on a live stream, that's ridiculous. <laughs> You're from Turkey, okay. Oh, if you don't know, I'm in New Zealand, which is the other side of the planet, basically. Uh, which mic am I using? Okay. Yeah, it's going to be a bit slow to start, I think, because no one would have been told the right date because I had the wrong date set on my live stream. That is dumb. Yeah. Thanks, Fred, for pointing it out when you dropped in at some point. Left the comments questioning it. Oh, well, hopefully we can get you eventually. Notification's gone out. I've got an email saying it's got started, so it should all be all right. LV vlog, how's it going? Yeah, so we'll see how it goes. I'm, I'll probably play with some test gear today. I've got an idea of something I want to work on. So, we'll see how we go with that. Let's pop this chat out. I can look at it a bit better. Then I can also include it in the screenshot here as well. Let me just find that. Sort of messing around getting started off with these things. Uh, Google Chrome chat. There somewhere, something like that. Right. Get my windows where I want them. So yes, I put a posing test gear. The sign I want to play with today. It's not too complicated hopefully if it goes all right could be a disaster who knows how do you pronounce that ov of ov that's again much new people here today it's interesting let's check on twitter and make sure everyone knows i'm actually live If you don't follow me on Twitter, you can check me out on there. There'll be links in the description down below for um, my live stream stuff. If I can get this to actually type like I want. It'd be really great if it didn't. Let me set up. Good, you get in there. Uh, 
Hello, the blog. You're working on a 100 watt FM exciter. You thought you stopped by? Okay, FM exciter, eh? Giving a computer PSU to bench PSU. Oh yeah, okay. I think the only thing you watch out for knows is making sure you've got enough loading on the actual outputs. Because sometimes I don't like to not have enough loading, so you have to make sure you actually have a constant load anyway. Um, sometimes you don't always have to worry about it, but sometimes it's a good idea to put like a big five watt resistor across them, just to put a little bit of load on them, so they don't actually shut themselves down and stuff like that. Oh yeah, putting on the bench. Yeah, it's always fun trying to see what's going to blow up next, isn't it? <laughs> Hopefully it's not a catastrophic bloody failure of the next one which takes out half the unit. It's always a pain when that sort of thing happens. Especially if it's RF stuff. Um, yeah, uh, whether, you know, driver fails, it takes out the, the, uh, the finals or vice versa. It's always fun. I hate working on amplifiers and stuff like that because of that reason. RF stuff, because I used to get asked to fix. CB radio amplifiers and ham radio amps, you know, some time ago, but I basically refused to do it. I, I'd do it occasionally, people are like new, um, that would be about it. I didn't like to do it because the risk is that you replace all those parts, fire it up, and it could blow again, you know, because you've missed something which is not obvious, or they use it and it blows up because it turns out their antenna's got a problem, that kind of thing. So um, I just I avoid them. <laughs> Use a 10 ohm 50 watt resistor. Oh, okay. Yeah, cool. You're onto it then. Yeah. It's interesting why I've got a whole bunch of new people here. It's really interesting. And it's great. Good to see everyone here. So if you're not subscribed to me yet, um, you may be already. That's fine. If you are, great. Um, if you're not subscribed to me yet, then subscribe. Click the bell, bell icon to get notifications about the videos. Um, and I do live streams every once in a while when I get the chance, when I have the motivation and I've got something to actually look at and um, if you're not familiar with the channel then I also do a lot of electronic repairs and stuff like that as well so nah, have a look I've got 860 odd videos, something like that, done so far so doing a lot of test gear repairs and uh, done some CB stuff, Arduino USB 32s, 3D printing, quite a, quite a mix there, product reviews. Hey Julian, how's it going? Yeah, so, this would have been a faster start, I think, if I put the right date on the stream and I advertised it. <laughs> uh, put it for next week for some reason, I don't understand why I did that. Oh, you've got an FCC license, right? So no CB amps. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you're doing commercial stuff, then you have to look after yourself, don't you? Hey, Ian, how's it going? So, so Dave, Big Clive has got his supercomputer. So I've got my super real. I was playing around with that last night, setting it up. Yeah, well, I've got a copy, but it's already half gone. It's my second one in the past half an hour. Standby in the cat. It's usually because it's running off a capacitor, and it's probably off one of the supply rails. So whichever supply rail um, that LED is running from will take a while to discharge because of the capacitance on it. So um, it will stay on for a little while. That'd be all it is. He's expecting a heavier load on that particular rail, so therefore it's just discharging capacitors. Marco, how's it going? Lots of new people. Excellent. Yeah, 
Yeah, so what I'm thinking about doing today is playing around with my Datra multimeter, which is behind me in the stack. The uh, 1082, because the crystals have arrived, which I can use to swap in on the clock oscillator to try and um, improve the noise on it. Well, the noise is already pretty good, to be honest. It's almost tempting not to do anything, but it's not the right crystal that's in there now. So what I'll be looking at doing there is probably changing it out, pulling the thing down. Unfortunately, it means dismantling all this stack here because it's, it's here. That unit there is what I want to look at. So I have to get this out. Um, but that's what I'm thinking of anyway. Or we could do the Solotron 7075, pull that thing apart and um, change that proprietary socket to a different proprietary socket. So a couple of options here. I definitely want to tinker with something today. Last time I did an awful lot of talking. I didn't get a lot done, did we, last time? I did a couple of things, but it wasn't much. I have to try and do things on live stream. You can't quite see my shirt, can you? Let me just tip it down slightly more. You can't quite see my shirt there. Hold right. on. So, yeah. there you go. There you can see the shirt. Don't like having text cut off things. I have nudged it. Right. So, let's see how we go. So, I've been meaning to look at it for ages. It's just damn book here, this thing. Book, got this book a while ago. Oh, electronics. I haven't read it yet. Well, it's quite thick. Cybertron sounds good. Yeah. So, it's lots of educational information about electronic componentry and circuit design and things like that. It's really, really good. Um, Dave Jones recommended it some time ago. And it's excellent re reference material, but... I actually want to sit down and read this thing, and I don't know, it's it's a lot of reading, and it's also a lot to try and digest as well. Um, you know, usually I think you just look up a certain type of thing you're interested in at a particular time, and then you look that up and find information about it. You know, a bit like a dictionary. But, um, yeah, I actually want to, I just pulled that out, because I've had it on my shelf for know, two years. I thought I should probably pull that thing down, actually sit down and start reading some of it. Uh, okay, check my shelves, excellent. So yes, you began to read it, but it's too long. Yeah, it's, it's a lot. There's a lot there. So I did actually read some of it, and I can't remember what, I was, what section I was actually reading now. And it is very technical. So you do have to sort of concentrate on what you're reading, can't I sort of just mind numbingly oh, that's the word I'm looking for. You can't just read through it quickly or skim it, you know, you can't you can't do that. You have to actually read it thoroughly and it's a great book for reference for the internet, yeah, I suppose. I mean a lot of times if I want to find out that something I'm doing a Google search. So that's, that's certainly true. And the plot sucks. <laughs> yeah ending really bad, eh? <laughs> um yeah so I thought anyway, I'm gonna get that because um, I just wanted to have something I can actually sit down and actually do some proper self-education about some certain things, you know, certain aspects. I mean, I, there's a lot of things I do not know because I'm not formally trained, so therefore there's lots of things that are gaps in my knowledge and you know, things I haven't learned about yet. So that's why I bought that book because I was going to sit down and just try and fill in some of the gaps, you know. So, yeah, I haven't got around to it yet. It's one of these things, so... I'll, yeah, so if it is like little books about oh, that thick, you know, three three pages or something, maybe I'd read it then. <laughs> maybe a hundred little books about three pages long. Oh. But, uh, yeah. Well, a solar trauma one is uh, potentially interesting in that the, as you, most of you, most of you probably 
So most of you probably know it's got a little round proprietary socket on the front. And I've only got one cable and I want to sell this unit which I've got sitting down here sitting at my desk right now. And I want to sell that. But I've only got one cable which fits my unit here. Oh, my cat's coming so low. Anyway. Um, so I want to swap that socket out for a more accessible one. Hey! Making lots of noise. So the, um, the option is either using a proprietary socket, I know a different version which is easier to get, at least it was easier for me to get, and much cheaper, or um, change the binding posts. Now I can do either method, I've got all the gear to do either way. I think the swapping out of the socket to a different type of round socket is the easier way to do it. But then I've got another problem, and the problem is that I don't have any wire to make a new lead up. Hey Christian. This is the cat you saw last time, I think. Oh. Let's have a look at looking out the window. I'm not sure that one it doesn't like to be picked up this one. Unless you're gonna panic and run away, Bob. No? No, oh, she's hungry what it is. Don't want their breakfast. Anyway, um, Gonna be out for ages, this cat. She's hungry. The cat's want breakfast. So, yeah, so the, I can put a round one on there, but I don't have a cable for it, so I don't have any suitable five core, high quality wire to make a new lead with, which is the problem I've got now. I've got some simple of cables. But I don't have really anything suitable for that because it's potentially a thousand volts input, so I need to be able to withstand a thousand volt and um, be flexible enough to not break the strands and stuff like that. Because I've got some other stuff I could use, but it's not actually the right stuff. Um, probably can't take the voltage, and it probably fail from flexing and stuff as well. So it's not really suitable. So that's the problem with using that particular method. Is well, that would be easier to do on the unit. I need to try and sort some suitable wire. Your alternative, say, is to put on banana plugs, which makes it more universal. So everyone's got banana leads, not a problem. So that's probably the better way to go, but that requires a much more involved modification. So I'd have to do some work on the front panel there. I mean, Ian's done this on yeah, one of these units as well. He's done the same thing on his. He did a video on it, and he put some banana jacks on the front of his, and he took quite a bit of modification to get that done. Um, so. I'm not so keen to do that, but it may be necessary. Um, you know, just for simplicity in some ways, you know, then just use standard cables, 19 millimeter spacing, that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, so that's an option. But so the Datron is behind me, which I'm thinking about swapping that crystal out, taking the thing apart. Taking the digital board out, swapping that crystal, um, checking the frequencies running out, and that sort of stuff. So the frequency it uses, get a calculator, is interesting. So let's see, uh, what the hell was the original one? Chunk of the original crystal is 1.9 megahertz or something. Uh, one nine six six zero eight, so one point nine six six zero eight megahertz. Hey Tony, how's it going? Nothing on the bench yet. We're just trying to decide what we're going to do. So the reason that crystal is interesting is I'll show you one point nine six six zero eight. One nine six six zero eight. It's actually nine eight zero zero because it's based on hertz because it's per cycle. Um. And if I divide that by 60, which is the default line frequency for that crystal, I get try and get it on screen so you can see it. See that? If it'll focus, kind of wants to focus. Yeah, try and get get a reflection out of the monitor there. Anyway, so focus on that. There we go. So 
three two seven six eight. Sound familiar? Three two seven six eight. Well, that's a divisible by binary. And if I look at the fifty hertz version, um, if I remember what it is. Which is the crystal I just got, which is a 1.6384 megahertz crystal. And for the same reason, it's divisible by 32768. So that's done so the clock frequency of the unit and the sampling rate as in time with the um, line frequency, so that each time there's line noise. Or in the waveform, the sound wave noise, which you get everywhere, it's ambient, you know, everyone's got it. And um, that way, it's always sampling at the same point in that waveform to try and minimize the effect of the waveform of the mains noise. So that's why it's done that way. Hey, Johnny. Uh, X conundrum. Or conundrum. With X's at the end. So, yeah, that's the reason it's done that way, but it's quite interesting the way it's got that fixed frequency in there. Like the other Datron model meters I've worked on, they've got a PLL and VCO module, which is in that region instead. And that's line locked, which is the same as what I was doing on Cybertron last week. We were playing with that one. Was it that one? Last week? I can't remember what we did last week. Maybe it was that. Yeah, it was Cybertron playing with last week, wasn't it? And um, so, it's exactly the same kind of thing where it's line locked to frequency and adjust the PLL and the VCO using the phase detector against the line to tweak the frequency. So exactly the same kind of setup. But again, the higher level one, this is a that's what using 1062, this is that PLL VCO combination. And the 1082, which is what's behind me, um, uses the fixed frequency, which is interesting the way they've got that in there like that. Whereas we would have thought that they adjustable version with the PLL would be better. you think so anyway. It's interesting. Maybe there's Jitter or something in it which they worry about. Yeah. So. So it's a bit um, So it's a bit um of a decision between doing the Cybertron, which is going to be more mechanically involved, or the Datron, which is going to be dismantling it and playing with crystals and oscillators. So, a bit of a toss up between. I might well do either one, really. I don't, I don't really care which one. I've got to do them both. Um, we, could even, we could even do both, maybe, if one doesn't take very long. It's possible. So you know, it's coming through. Then so I, was, I was, didn't quite see what it said. All oh, right, okay. Fifty fifty. Well, Ian, you don't. We need to see the Cybertron. We, you've already done it yourself. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, you've already done that particular modification. So you're very familiar with it. I mean, let's pull the thing out. It's been sitting here for ages. This beast. So that's the socket we've got to change. That one there. Probably you aren't familiar with it. It's a long time ago. Yeah, well. I'm sure it'll come back to you. <laughs> so I've got um, some quite nice binding posts. I've got some quite nice ones up there, which I picked up. They look not from China, but they look like actually quite good quality ones. I've, I've actually bought a couple of sets of them because um, I got the first slot and I thought, oh, they look quite nice. They look like they were quite well designed. And um, they actually seem like good quality, so I bought another one. 
So I've got a few sets of them actually. So I actually intentionally got a set of five, so I've got different colours. So I should be able to actually do all five terminals. A TPU emulator. What's a TPU emulator? Not familiar with that. So, for those of you who missed the intro, I got my Nixie, Nixie reel going here. My super reel. No, Big Clive's got a super computer. <laughs> I thought, well, actually, it looks quite good just on a reel like that, just sitting on that. It's like rather than unrolling it and stringing it across things, it's like, it looks quite nice like that. I played with some sequences on it and it goes through three different sequences and three different patterns. I thought it would create a bit of interest. Yeah, come on, Christian, you've got to fill us in now. What's the TPU? It's probably sitting typing away for you, which trying to explain it. Just shut this door so those cats don't keep me hanging heads off. Shut one some kind of airflow. Do you need all the relays? IFL 829M. What's an IFL 829N? Oh, come on, this is getting more and more questions coming up. <laughs> Decapping relays. Well, the only reason I think to do that would be to clean the contacts because they do get dirty um, for example my fluke here just there that's a 5450A loads of relays in that thing and um, they all the relay contacts were dirty and I had to um, exercise them in order to try and clean up rather than pulling them apart I did try and pull one apart I wasn't really much success with that could have done it in fact, I think in the end I did manage to get one apart and clean it. So, yeah, but it's, it wasn't easy to get them apart. It's not really designed for it. Um, but, yeah. It would have been to clean the relays, contacts. If it's old, I'd understand it. If it's relatively modern, then I didn't wouldn't really see the need. Time processing unit. Some fancy, almost truly complete time processor. Right. All oh, right. Okay. Try and run the computer. Playing with LED lighting. ESP twelve. I'm going to look at the link now. PW inboard. All oh, right. Okay. We've got fused outputs. Nice. Using MOSFETs. So I actually did a PWM board myself some time ago, and that's just running for an Arduino. Um, that's actually in my mother home. So I actually got some, I can have some sitting here. Some of these RGB strip lights. These are literally just LED strips with red, green, and blue LEDs, right? So, and you're individually powered. These are 12 volt powered, so it's got individual lines. And I've got these in a motorhome. Well, I had these in a motorhome. There's currently nothing on there. I've taken them all off because I'm need to do some rush repairs to the roof. And um, I built myself a little controller using a Duino and some. What did I use? I can't think what I use the drivers now. TIP 41s? I like might have been. I can't remember. And um, so I'm using those switching from the Duino. And those are doing PWM to control the lights with those. So it's a similar kind of thing, but obviously not wireless. It's all hard wired. Right. 3D printed box as well. 
Nice. There's something else going to show as well, was there? Oh, that's right. Okay. I repaired a um, AC power brick the other day. AC mains buddy um, old transformer type style hold on pick it up what are these things plug in blocks so this is another one ancient this thing's old but it's sitting around for ages and um, this one's also blown up now what I actually did is I did a project for my wife basically which was to build a snail fence. So we've got a little veggie garden thing at the back of the garage there and um, got a snail fence on it. So the idea is got these two little wires, exposed wires, galvanised wires, running along the top of the framing of the veggie garden because it's a raised bed. And it's running a small differential voltage across there. So I'm running, I think I was running 12 volts so this one right there, yeah, 12 volts AC, not DC, AC. Always get galvanic problems. So, um, and that is just running across those two lines. And these basically is just a small transformer in a box, sort of really are. And I've had a few of them fail, obviously because I didn't put any kind of protection on there. It's just straight from the transformer output, straight to those wires. And I think if it's raining or something like that, you get a lot of drag on those rails, and it tends to overload the supply and blows them up so I've actually done some changes now and actually made it so it, it, um, it's got a basically a nine resistor so if it does get dragged down too much it will just heat the resistor up instead so reduce the current so it should help reduce the chance of blowing transformers so um, well I did one of those the other day I pulled it apart I did some video on it I think did I? yes I did so um, I basically pulled apart the unit and there's a thermal fuse in the transformer. So I cut open the tape that was on the transformer and pulled that thermal fuse out and replaced it with another one. So I think I'll have to do the same thing with this because this is also dead. It's likely the same setup. And I've also got a 5 volt switch mode little block sitting over there as well, which is dead. It's brand new. Came with something I bought, it didn't really matter. No, I didn't really use it, it's been sitting on my shelf for I don't know how many years, a couple of years probably. And um, I went to go and use it on that little, oh, that side, that magne magnifying lamp thing there, which I did a feature in a mailbag recently. Um, I went to go and use it on that, and it was dead, just nothing. And I actually had two of them which are identical, and I plugged the other one in, that worked fine. So I might have to pull that thing apart as well and have a look at that. Um, yeah, well, the, this pattern that's on here now, that's not me, that's just the demo pattern which is in the default um, uh, Arduino code. So, in the actual library, it's got example sketches in there, and um, it's got some pre written sketches and you just use the examples on that, and that's what that's doing right now. I did actually modify a little bit. I do like um, this. We've got this one here, which is doing this. This is called the Fast LED Library. And um, is it this pattern that's doing? Or well, next one? I think it's the one after this one. Um, I actually mixed two together. So it's doing a combination of two different things. This one here. So it's doing that swirling backwards and forwards thing. And it's also got what's called glitter. It's got glitter. So I added that to it, which gives it a bit of a different effect. That looks pretty cool. That wasn't originally done that. That's so I don't know. Um, but it's one of the features it had. I'll just merge two together, as it were. Um, but yeah. Okay, change self time to use what you had available. Well, with the current component shortages, it's, it's probably not a bad idea, seeing as there's lots of stuff you can't get. It's not too surprising. Anyway, 
we should tinker with something. So you're sitting here chatting the whole time. So the question is, do we do the Solitron or do we do the Datron? I'll do poles on this thing. I can do a pole. Here you are. Let's do a pole. Create a pole. If I can even type the words, it'd be great. I haven't tried doing a poll before, this is... Alright. This is going to be confusing. I've done this wrong. <laughs> Give me that one. Get with that one. Right. Here we go. Pole done. Must be good luck. I tend to have good luck, to be honest. Alright. Uh, Let's finish it is again. I missed some bits. The Mossy had a fake. Oh, damn. Uh, one and a fish out of 4.2 volts. So it probably was still a MOSFET then, but just not the one you expected it to be. Oh, uh, dear. Anyway. Yes. So, see what this pole turns out as. Electron's afraid of me. Maybe. I don't know. I, I do tend to have good luck with things. Like All the stuff I've repaired, or attempted to repair, I've been very lucky with. I think if everything I've ever done, since I started the YouTube channel and, and doing repairs on the channel, um, there's been one thing I haven't been able to fix. Just one. Um... And that probably still could be fixed if I could put the effort into it. Because it's a... What the hell was it? It was a transistor test or something like that. Got an old one. Big box like this. And it's got this big analog meter on it. I don't know, that kind of size. And um, it's got an open winding on the meter movement. So the meter doesn't move. And that's as far as I got. Because like, well... Tried it out, it's like, ah, uh, no good. But um, I even did some video, I was doing a live stream on it, and I had the magnifier up there, well, had my good microscope down there, and I was getting right into the windings of the, of the meter movement, and and I even like, took the ends off and redid the ends and stuff like that in case there's a problem with those and that sort of stuff, and um, it didn't fix it. So it's obviously I'm, I'm within the winding somewhere, it's gone open. If I really wanted to, I'd probably pull it apart unwind it all, find the break, put it back together again. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't really worth it for the $50 unit, whatever it was. Um, got accused once of only showing on YouTube the successful repairs. Um... Actually, no. Actually, it's a good point. Actually, thinking about it, the I do have some failed repair videos. Thinking about it, I'm telling lies here. What is it? I've got a battery charger. Oh, sorry, I've got my folder. I've got a folder here with all my I call them filler videos. So that these are videos which aren't so good. Um, I may never even publish them because they're not actually complete or um, they weren't that interesting in the end. <clears throat> I've got 11 videos potentially in here so I've got a battery charger couldn't fix it um, ch -ch 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 -ch. 
that that's only five repair got in that folder is a battery charger couldn't fix. But there has been another one. I'm thinking, I'm trying to think what it was now. But I mean, all the one really had in mind is all these basic test kit stuff that I buy. These items of which I purchased like that. The failed repairs have usually been things people have given me to have a look at for them. Um, the battery charger wasn't mine; it was somebody else's. It was it being fried, had a big spike go through it, and completely blew it up. Um, and um, what was the other one? I'll see that meltometer thing, which I said that test test whatever it was. I can't exactly what it was now. Um, that's the only thing I've actually purchased which I couldn't fix at this stage anyway. But I've been pretty lucky. Could have been a lot worse. <clears throat> yes. Yes, I've definitely been lucky with repairs. So been times where it could have been a very different situation. Right. Well, so far this pole is very much nick and nick. It's fifty-six percent towards the solar drop. That's pretty tight. There's not much in it, is there? Probably one more vote to go back to Datron. I don't know. <laughs> So, Solotron's looking like the one we're going to be doing. Oh, no, see, 50%. Another vote, 50% Datron now. So it's 50% Solotron, 50% Datron. 50-50, exactly. <laughs> oh, dear. Knew it. Oh, dear. Okay. We might have to do both. Pitch analyzer you couldn't fix. I'm just trying to remember if I've watched that video or not. Well, 50-50s, it might have to do both, yeah. Um, the only trying if I did actually watch that pitch analyzer video. I probably did. Pretty sure I have seen it. Pretty sure I'll survive. I'll do what I want. Well, I'm leaning towards Datron myself. That's my preference. I think. Oh no! Look, got another vote for Solotron now. <laughs> Big we did both. I mean, Datron's probably going to be relatively simple to do. I hope. Um, let's go open it up. Take the board out. Sort the crystal out. Now it does actually state in the manual for swapping frequencies that it should be changing some capacitors as well. Because <clears throat> obviously it's an oscillator circuit, and so you have to think, think about the oscillator and getting everything to actually um, it's stable and doesn't drift and stuff like that. So the original capacitors are supposed to be swapped out for some other ones, which are supposed to be polystyrene caps. Unfortunately, I don't have any polystyrene caps, and I did actually did a little search yesterday to see if I could find some, and I couldn't actually find the ones it specified. So I guess they're not particularly made anymore, that particular style. Or you can, I could find some polystyrene caps that weren't the right voltage rating or the right um, capacitance rating. So I need a 470 picofarad and a 120 picofarad, um, apparently. Now I do have ceramic caps of those values, so I could drop those in. But I suspect that's the reason they want polystyrene is because ceramics aren't very temperature stable. So if you heat or cool a ceramic cap, it will change capacitance. Um, or also very sensitive to vibration and that sort of stuff. So it's entirely possible that the reason I want polystyrene is because it's got better stability. Titronic 496, we reprogrammed 2716. Didn't go well. That's a shame. So yeah, 55% Solitron now. So yeah, I think I'll probably do the Datron. That's what I think I'll go with. I'll do that one first, at least. Then if that doesn't take too long, we could do the Solidron too. No reason why we could do both. But these, um, I was thinking about this, keeps catching my eye, which is the idea, I suppose. What I was going to do with these, 
is put some like on the back area of my benching um, or on the back of my desk and do some just some ambient lighting effects on the back of the desk and when I'm doing videos showing the desk setup um, it's got something in the background it's created a bit of interest you know um, that's what I bought this for but when I was testing it yesterday I thought actually it looks pretty good just on the reel sitting like that you know it's quite a good pattern on that so that's why I just shoved it up here so I bought some more <laughs> so I've, I've, I've ordered uh, two more rolls so it's another 10 meters of neo pixels so that's way more than I need um, as is always the case because I'm pretty sure I'll end up finding other uses for them what I think I'll do is put some on the back of my desk because I intended to you know, around the shelving or around the test gear some of that I will run those um, I'm not sure if you're going to create much of an issue with interference or anything like that we may be creating noise issues with measurements I'm not sure yet they might do um, anything like that which is running which could potentially do that so I don't think that would be a problem I might have to turn them off on a certain circumstances but I expect it would be okay um, yeah all right, so we'll do Datron first, then we'll do Soltron, I think. If a Datron doesn't take too long. The only problem is I've got to dismantle my stack, and my little light effect here is going to disappear. I thought about it last night. So actually, I've got one of these little mains transformer things here. You can see it in the shop, right? The, um, I picked these up a while ago. It's an LED power supply. They weren't very expensive. It's like really universal main supply and um, output's 12 volts. They're about, you can, you can vary it by about a volt or so, one and a half volts, I think, and go up and down by. Something like that. I think it went down to about 11 and up to 13.7, something like that. And so I've got a collection of various bits and pieces in my drawer, like various power supplies, things like that. And I thought I'll get this one out and hook this up. This is like the most suitable one. It says 10 amps max. Yeah, nah. Um, I haven't believed that for a minute. Probably 5 amps max, more likely. Anyway, I noticed that the power supply, you've got the terminals here for connecting up the wiring, mains wiring coming in and the output coming out. Um, it was all like slid back, so that's strange. So I actually pulled the thing apart. And the soldering inside it was atrocious. So I resoldered the entire circuit board before I actually used it. So, um, yeah, I'll have to do the same thing with the other one. I'll be able to use that eventually. I'll have to pull it apart and resolder everything. But it seems to be working fine. It's not getting hot or anything like that. It's so, there's no, no warmth in there whatsoever. The LED's got a little bit of warmth in them. But I'm only running it at 50% um, brightness. So, not, not even fully brightness. So. That seemed adequate for what I was doing. Rather than stressing everything, running half brightness, it means it will last forever. So let's pull this stuff apart. Let's get this out of the way, I think. I'll just move it out of the way. So this is what's driving it. I'll unplug it so I can show you. That is the controller that's driving it. Just a little Pro Mini. Of course, the camera might focus on it. Well, you know, what I do that for? What I found with these actually is a little bit interesting. I found a problem with these. So I purchased a whole bunch of these little Pro Minis. Or Pro Micros, are they? Pro Mini, Pro Micro. Pro Mini, yeah. Um, I purchased a bunch of them a while ago off of from um, AliExpress. And I had a, I noticed a problem with them before when I wanted to use one for something. The raw input didn't work, which is supposed to be up to like, I think 16 volt max and like input, and it's got a little bolt in uh, either 3 volt, 3 volt, or 5 volt regulator on the board, depending on which version it is. And I could never get the raw power to work. Anyway, I got one of these out, didn't work, same issue, raw power wouldn't work. Got another board, raw power wouldn't work. So I ended up finding out that the little voltage regulators on those boards isn't working <laughs> so it ran at 5 volts but not the raw input power so what I actually did is I put a little 78L05 on the ball because that's what I've got laying around 
got a bunch of them, so I chuck one of those on the board instead to power it. Right, let's get a stack this metal. Hey Peter, thanks for the five bucks again. <laughs> hey Dave, uh, displays aren't flaky, not really. Um, they are hard to find. I actually made a module to replace them with, actually, if you're not familiar with it. Hmm. So I actually did a replacement display module for the Datrons because I actually picked one up, it was at 1062 and the display was smashed on it and I ended up designing a replacement display for them so um, I did a video on that, a few videos on them so if you ever had a Datron which had a bad display I'll make one I was actually thinking that might be more demand for them, I did actually sort of advertise them a little bit didn't, didn't really do much of it, didn't really pursue it but um, didn't seem to be much demand for the Datron, for the Datron displays, so although I've designed a replacement display module, it does require modifications to the driver board. Um, actually, did it on live stream. Actually, did re reverse engineering on the live stream. Um, yeah, this is probably about six months ago, I think. Yeah, pretty sure it was about six months ago. Yeah. Anyway, let's change views. Now I'll keep going to do it directly in OBS just here. And the thing is right here I've got my stream deck. <laughs> now I've reorganized my desk a little bit because I wasn't well, I was having some problems with layout because of the new soldering iron I've got. And I was finding it is tending to interfere a little bit with the camera shot. So I'm not sure if I've got the camera in exactly the right place yet. I might have to shift it slightly more or something, I'm not quite sure yet. Um, anyway. So this big beastie here. But yeah. Um, what size digital side? Which has got digital borders underneath or on top? I can't remember. I think it's on top. To find the right spanner for this well, driver. Is that one here? Great. Oh, let's pull this thing apart. I think it's on the top side of this unit. Actually, I think I need to pull both sides off anyway. I was something else I need to do while I've got it apart. Yes, I need to uh, back up the EPROMs that are in here whilst it's apart. I wanted to do that job at the same time. So I've got to do the crystal and back up all the EPROMs because they aren't currently backed up. So I need to do that. So I'd like to do and I'll sh share those online as well.
I think there are some EPROMs available for these, which are, I think it's the 781, but it's a different version. Those are the ones which use the 2532 EPROM. This one's got the 732s in it, or 27C32s. And um, the code is different, or will be different. So I suppose I'll be getting the EPROM programmer out and uh, reading the EPROMs during the live stream so I can put it back together again. Come on, lift up. <sighs> so this is all I've got to get out. And the crystal's over here. And then before I take this out, I'm going to check yeah, one nine six six point zero 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 or zero eight zero. So there's also these capacitors here, which are supposed to get swapped out. There's one there, one there, and it's currently a three thirty picofarad, and something else I can't read. But yeah, it's polystyrene and a, and a ceramic. So the problem is, like I said, I don't have any polystyrene caps. So I'm going to have to just make the best of the situation and put two ceramics in and see how it goes. But I may need to tweak things and um, and just see what frequencies we get out as well. Actually, I should check the frequencies before I pull this apart, shouldn't I? Let's see what frequencies are actually coming out of it now. To see if it's actually accurate or not. Just for curiosity's sake. Um, I think I'll use the scope to probe that. Fuse the scope's is pretty good actually. Close enough. should do is uh, desk and top screen and then in the top screen I shall shove the scope display shove it up there Full screen that. There we go. You can't kind of see what I'm doing, then, can't you? We've got this set up for anyway. point is I think the ground point was that one that's the ground and I should really plug this in don't make a difference right where's the frequency output let's try there. It doesn't look as there.
this is within the oscillator, so it's not the best place to be trying to measure it. Big DC offset. So where's this go? Here we go, that'd be the output there. That should be a safe place to measure. So that crystal frequency there currently is off frequency, so that's 1.96582. Five. Just up towards the right hand side underneath the signal logo there. That's the actual hardware frequency counter. So that's the frequency that's coming out of it. So that's actually wrong right now. That's the frequency a little bit. So maybe the actual frequency isn't super critical. But um, what's this? This is from aging. Anyway, we can take this board out, swap it. Because I've got new crystals right here. I've got a pack of five. I only wanted one, but I could only find a pack of five, it would seem. And that's just like off eBay, so hopefully it actually work. We'll find out, I suppose. Stay there. It's falling down. Okay. Well, I'm hoping they work. Uh, that's the problem with this one. It's got this bloody battery taped to the side. I haven't changed that yet. Interesting arrangement. The battery measured good, so I'm, that's why I haven't changed it because it has seemed to be an okay battery. And from what I can also see, it appeared to be um, higher capacity the battery would have been putting in. So that's why I left it so far at least. But now I need to get this thing off here and not short it out without otherwise I'm going to lose my memories. Mind you, I just means recalibrating it, and to be honest, I can do that anyway, and I already have done it. Um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's a bit weird the way they've done this, it's sort of stuck to the side of this PCB here, it's like just there, stuck down. Really odd. Don't know why I just don't really use the proper battery, but uh, that is. That's right, I think it's moving around, so I actually put a bit of my liquid electrical tape down there to. Attach it. Here we go. That's now off there. So if I lose memory, is not too worried. I can just recalibrate it again. That's some plugs off. Yep. So it's get this board out I'll check the chat again once I've got these screws out so this new Jabe UD 1200 soldering station which I got the other day which I did a review on published it last week um, it's been working really well. I actually used it properly yesterday when I was resoldering a power supply. It's got some quite heavy traces in there, and it made really no issue of that. It just just did it, no problem whatsoever. Even with a lower temperature, like I'd normally use, maybe for heavy traces on the KSGR, I would have used something like 370 or something like that on that iron with the tips I tend to use on it. And um, this, even though it's got small tips, I see a 315 is just doing just fine. So 
So I think we can also do is test this out of unit. So let's worry about dropping this washer. So what I'd actually like to do is change the crystal over and not put it back in the, the actual multimeter, but just power it externally, inject my own voltage and um, power the oscillator and see what we get out of it. And uh, just be sure that it's working and doing the frequency we need, because I can tweak the frequency. I'll just maybe change capacitance values and stuff like that in order to get the frequency as accurate as I can. That's the plan anyway. I haven't had this board out yet, I mean, yeah, I haven't taken this board out before. It's the first time I've taken it out, this one. But it's a shame I don't have the right capacitor for that. I mean, it's the, um, it specifies a polystyrene, that's what I would like to put in there. So I might have to look at that in some more detail later on. Right, that's the screws. Now you've got these little posts I've got to get out. Let's check the chat first. And let's go back to that display there. ASCII table. Um, I don't remember it's currently cut up on my scope screen. Uh, the ASCII code.com.ar that's the website it says there. And the 8 bit PC, how's it going? So let's get this thing out. Have to be careful with my finger, I injured it the other day. I um, took a big chunk of flesh out of the end of it. Kind of hurts if I knock it or something like that. It's quite painful. So I'm trying to be careful of that. Come on. This post always a pain. There's probably some special tool you can use to get this done. There we go. That's the first one out. Second one going yet? This battery you've got to be careful about not shorting out if I can avoid it. If I can avoid reprogramming it all, it'd be great. Or recalibrating it all. hooked on. So there's three of the EPROMs I need to do as well. Right, so these three EPROMs here I need to read. So I want to back those up at the same time. Obviously there's that crystal we want to swap out. Now crystals I've got, I've actually got three wires on them, but one's just minor. It's a, um, a case shielding. So it should basically be the same footprint, but it's got a case shield. Now these case shields can be handy. Of course, if the frequency is a bit high, 
you can actually ground the casing and actually drop the frequency down a bit because it's got the capacitive effects and it drags the frequency down. So it can be handy having a case shield in order to help control the frequency. Also helps reduce noise and stuff like that as well, just tends to work better. So generally try and shield them if you can. So that's something I was going to look at. The actual soldering station. I was going to potentially pull this thing apart today and do that power switch because I've noticed that a bit of a weird thing with it. Actually, I'll show you. Can I show you? I probably can. So, if it up, see that switch is lit up right now? That's turned off. Well, the neon shouldn't be on unless the actual unit's on, you'd think. So I think that the actual wiring onto the switch is backwards. I think they're going onto the wrong side of the switch with the main supply. So it's illuminating the neon all the time, even though it shouldn't be. That's what I think is happening. Uh, desoldering gun, we'll need that going as well. So, what I'll do is I'll swap the crystal first, see what things we get, and go from there. Now, there are there's a ground trace right there. This time's a rework on this board. I might as well look for that one a minute. There's a little bit of rework over here, maybe. It's probably the um, DSE from sockets. No, it looks fine. Um, yes, yeah, so there is a pad over here, which I think is an earth. Yeah, I think this big round one just here, which you can't see too, I'm sure, is the earth. So if I need to tie the earth down, I've got one right there I can use. Let's get a closer view. Maybe it is done to see this, make the switch easier to see as possible, but to me, a neon should only be on if the thing is powered on. So I'm going to take that switch out and swap the wires around. But I was wanting to put a switch on the front panel anyway, so I don't know if I actually move that switch or not, I'm not sure yet. I might just um, put a second switch in series. I'll have to do something, I think. Um. Bear with me, I shall be right back. Let me shouldn't have chat on this window. I should have chat in here, shouldn't I? And um what we're we looking for. Hold on, let me swap this. Let's get this chat in here. Let's copy this in. Here we go, we've got chat in here as well now. I'll do it on this one. Here we go. Little things I should be setting up a bit better. Yeah, I hate the switch on the back as well, so it's just one of these, one of the little pit hates I have as well. I really don't like it on the back. I think it should always be on the front. I mean, if you've got anything up against the wall, it's a bit hard to reach it, or it's at the back of your desk, out of the way, where you want things out of the way, so you've got your desk space to use. It's in the way. So, bear with me, I'll be back in a minute, I've just got to go and do something, and I'll be right back.
Right, I'm back. So, let's get this crystal out here, let's check the chat. Yeah, well, I don't know why I do that, it's just, you know, it's not like it's something you're not going to use, is it? You know, a power switch, you use it all the time. You know, every time you want to use a thing, it's like you turn it on and leave it on for a week. It's something you're going to use more frequently than the controls on the front, most likely. You know, you're more likely to change, well, you're more likely to power the thing on and off than you are to change the temperature settings on it. So it is a bit of a weird arrangement they have with thinking that you're not going to use a switch. Just get this out. So, <coughs> pros get the soldering gun. may not work. Let's see how we go. Yeah, kind of. It's not complete boost. Yeah, I think that one's out there. Stubborn. I should put it with a fresh shovel on there, would have worked a bit better. So, here's the original. It's got some little insulating pads on it, which I'll put on the new one as well. Let's transfer those over. It's got a recessed base on those, it's quite interesting. So, hopefully, these new crystals actually work. No idea. Could be fake. So that grounding wire that's on there, I could always swap it over to the side. I want to have the frequency visible from what from the edge, so it's currently kind of like the wrong way around. Always just to shift it off the other side. Like I said, I want to power this up on the bench, tune frequency, and then put it in the unit. Better on, shouldn't I? Give the fumes. Okay, so I've got the earth over here. I'm just going to leave these a little bit sticking out. This one's going to leave hang off for now, and if I need to, I can desolder it and swap its sides. So I can actually flip it over this way and put it through that hearth. In fact, I can probably just do that actually. Yeah, that will work. So I want to power the circuit up, so I need to find the supply lines and stuff like that on the board and um, power it in situ and see what things we get. I knew Ian would say that. Someone high Scott's soldering on. 
I was going to say, before I walked away, I said, you guys watch Ian. He's going to steal my stuff. He does it every time. He always invokes these panics and... <laughs> what's, what's the word I'm looking for? I can't think of the word. My, my vocabulary is not there today. Anyway. Well, the one I'm using now is the Jabe um, UD1200, and they've been out for a couple of years. They've been around for a little while, and I've actually been really impressed with it so far. It's probably the best quality iron I've got. Um, so, it's your job. <laughs> um, yeah, it's probably the best quality iron I've got, so it's. It, I'm really happy with it, actually. It seems like it's really well built. It's actually good, very good, so the price is a fair price for them I think you know they are fairly expensive but um, I think it's a worthwhile expenditure and there's a few little things like I said I don't like the display angle um, minor thing you know you can kind of see it but it's not the best it's better if you look a bit higher up and the switch on the back I think there's three things wasn't there the display angle switch on the back and oh yeah, the one degree steps they're the three things I didn't like um, but I just set mine to have the presets of 300, 350, 400. And that does fine. I'm using 300, 350 most of the time. So, right. Um, right, I need to find a circuit diagram for this thing. Let's pull this up and we'll look at the um, layouts and find where I need to find these power supplies from. I know exactly what page it is in the manual. I was looking at that yesterday. Let's sort of get the right manual. I also even OCR'd it yesterday as well. Make it easy to search. Right, let's get this in the top window. Come on. Get out the top window. Oh, I won't go in the top window because I've got the scope in the top window. There we go. Right. Let's change use to look you big enough, maybe. So I know it's basically the last pages in this manual. So down here, there's the dual board. And actually let's go to hmm that one instead for now so this little board there so this is the layout we've got here oh wrong window <laughs> click on this one okay so there's the crystal which I swapped but these are the two capacitors I'm also supposed to swap Right, C23, C24. So C23 is currently ceramic, C24 is currently polystyrene. So up here, I did find the circuit diagram just for the oscillator. Look at that. So there's C23, C24. So I need to put in 5 volts power, so link. 6 link 4, we'll put 5 volts on those that'll provide power to that and probably half the board as well shouldn't matter and I can then measure the output the TV22 hey Fred no, it's, yeah it's good spotting Fred actually you highlighted to me that I'd actually made a mistake and set the wrong date <laughs> so so no, it's not the twenty-first. Although I might be doing one next week as well. Who knows? Um, anyway, so anyway, um, I ground. That's easy. That's TB twenty-eight. 
that's the ground point. So I've got to find 2p22, which is at your output. Oh, actually, I think I've measured on R175. I think that's actually where I measured, or somewhere else on the ball. But I did find a frequency on a resistor, which is nearby. So I'll put it onto one of these links, which should be obvious on the board, hopefully. I can shove 5 volts in and power the oscillator up. So link oh, 40, link 6 and link 40. We'll find R174 as well to do that. So there's link 40 there. And there's link 6. So I'll just tap onto link 40. I'm going to shove 5 volts in there. So that was just I measured was on R98 here. So it's probably feeding through that resistor there. That's why I found that frequency. So T between 2 is there. So yeah, there we go. Um, R98. Was that on that diagram? R98. I don't see. Oh, there we go. I was measuring there. Oh, maybe I was loading it down then. Oh, well, maybe I was. Whoops. <laughs> I would load down the oscillators a little bit. Anyway, oh, is it? No, it's a buffer. So that's the oscillator there. That's the buffer. So it might be all right. Might go away with it, but it probably would have had some kind of effect. Anyway, it might. That might be why the frequency is wrong. So yeah. So link forty, link six. TP twenty two. Let's have a quick look. Link 40 and Link 6 are both insulated jumpers, but that shouldn't really be an issue. I can get onto the top end of the inductor. That's fine, I'll get onto that. Easy enough. So I can get onto the end of L1, just there. I'll get onto that easy enough. I don't mind powering the whole board, it shouldn't really matter. It shouldn't really matter. I mean, one of the tests you actually do on this, when you're doing the calibrations, is you actually do inject 5 volts into the ball with nothing connected to the ball and you would adjust a, um, a trimmer on there for a particular voltage threshold so um, the board does allow you to power it just with that 5 volt supply only and be okay so I'm not too worried about just injecting 5 volts only at that particular point so I think we'd be good I think we would be fine so I'll do that 5 volts in that to probably Probably put it over here on that junction because that's an easy one to get to, and we'll see what things we get. And I'll probably have to trim these capacitance values here and tweak those stuff. I've still got the original ones in there, which aren't the right ones for this crystal apparently, but it depends on the crystal. As it's not the original Datron crystal, it may have a different response, which is why I'm not worried about changing them yet. You might find that these ones I've got in here will work fine or be close enough or something. So, but I want to try and get this as accurate as I can, which isn't too hard. It's crystal you know capacitor values so I could even put a trimmer in potentially so 23 24 um, other way so there are a whole bunch of pads around here which are unpopulated from the original circuit design which is based on using a adjustable coil in a POL VCO arrangement Yeah, the 100 pf cross crystal have the most effect. That's right, because it'll be dragging the frequency down. So if the frequency is too high, I could probably potentially add some more capacitance to that. Maybe we'll see. Um, yeah, adding a trimmer is possible. Um, it's something I've got in mind if I need to. If I need to trick it. Um, another little trick is to like that parallel capacitor. You could put a series trimmer on that, and that then allows you to adjust the effect of that capacitor. So if the frequency is too low, you can reduce the loading of that series or that parallel capacitor by having the series trimmer with it. So, yeah, I play with crystals and stuff a bit from doing CV stuff, you know. So I'm fairly familiar with tweaking oscillator circuits and and those sorts of things. Fairly familiar. So, um, right, let's get this thing hooked up. And let's see about. Uh, that arrangement. Which 
to have chat in there too, shouldn't I? I just think I need to do a different... Um, yeah. Make it smaller. I probably just can't read it anymore. <laughs> Anyway, give it a go. So, I need some clips to get on here. Let's see what we'll use for this. the voltage before I hook to it. Don't power it on afterwards to find the power's turned on to set the 12 volts on a 5 volt rail because that'd be a bit of a disaster. So stick that there. Now I don't think I can clip onto that with this one. I might get lucky but I doubt it. Nah, not great. Anything else? This top might be better suited. Yeah, that works better. In fact, I might swap this one as well. I don't trust these two well. No, oh, no, that seems alright. In fact, yeah. Where's my clip? Goes on there. Now they took this on the same as well. It's also the ground. Hmm. Different type. Let me get that on. Actually, I could do this differently. We'll keep that in place. Put that on there. Although this is a massively long lead, this will do. Probably pick up some noise. Look at that. Okay, that should at least allow me to probe. And now I need to change screens again so you can see the scope. Like so. Hey Andre, how's it going? So unless I've got this completely wrong or bought up backwards, this should oscillate with a bit of luck. Or unless those crystal frequency uh, capacitors are completely wrong. Well we're getting nothing. Hmm. You're getting nothing. That is interesting. Did I hook onto the right test point? Let's hook straight onto this resistor. You can see it, you can see it. 
There we go, other one test point. Okay. Must be this one. That's what I want, is it? Hmm. Even that doesn't seem right. <laughs> that's definitely a frequency there. What's it doing? It's going over there. That's a nice strong signal there. Well, look at that. That's pretty impressive. It must be the output from that buffer. A full light round? Hmm. What is that thing? Two and three and a four, um, which is collector in the centre, I think. No, collector on the right. Just got to link us through to there. This is the DC offset on the collector. Let's look at the diagram again. Hold on. I'm guessing. I need to stop guessing. Uh, let's pull this back up. So, yeah, this is weird. This It said TP22. I wasn't getting anything there. I was getting TP21, which is noise. Q11 over here. R98. Hmm. <laughs> this doesn't seem to be matching quite right. Emitter, yeah, clitter, so I need to look up for the emitter side of it. Right. And R98 is where I'm getting a decent signal, interestingly. So, we'll look at the emitter side here. Get the trigger set right. Here we go, we've got a signal there. But it's interesting the way the base signal is actually higher than the emitter signal. Hmm, it's weird. Okay. I'll show you that again. So this is the emitter, but should be the stronger one. And that is 1.63791 megahertz. So that's quite a way down. And that is the base. Hmm. I'm surprised the base is stronger than the emitter. I wouldn't have expected that. And that's what's supposed to be TP22. Oh yeah, it is there, okay. Now it's to be a divided down clock. Okay, right, here we go. So yeah, TP22 is there. Just wasn't what I was expecting it to be. Okay. Let's hook back up to that. Big DC offset, of course. So, things is too low. So what I do is to play around with changing these capacitors. So 
So if I change the ceramic one first. I mean, that parallel capacitor that's across there, that will be dragging it down. But is it there for stability? I mean, it says to change those two capacitors there, so I'm going to look at doing those ones. That's what it's supposed to be changing, so I might just change one of them and see what happens. So that's 63791, right? You got that? 1.63791. Do is desolder from the top. Come on. No, I must be bent over the bottom. Of course it is. Right. Pretty sure it's that one. Is that one clogged again? I think it's clogged. It does that. Because the way it sits in the stand, the bits of solder will drop down onto the back of the tube. And then clock the tube up to the back. <laughs> and for fresh soul on this as well. Maybe Chris had just like this, struggling a bit with this ball. But this one's running quite cold. It's got a massive ground plane right here, so it's not helping. Looking like it's going to be super stubborn. One leg off. Which is bent, of course, so it doesn't want to pop out. Not just the old fashioned way. So this is a 330 picofarad. I'm going to ask for a 470. So let's put my name in. You're taking the leads off, but I've been lazy. Now, the problem is because I've just soldered this, it's all going to be hot, and it will affect the capacitance and the readings it will give. So, even if I test it right now, the readings won't be exactly right because the capacitance values will change. So, let's just try that first. Sure, everything's still attached okay, not shorting out. 
We're looking good. All right. So the scope on screen, we do. Power on. That looks almost no different. <laughs> One point six three seven nine zero. It's got worse. All right. They change other capacitor as well then. Well, I see if it drifts at all, but it's not. Okay, let's change the other one. It's supposed to be a 120. Comically easy, that one. So, that's an easy one. Right, 120. Like I said, I've only got ceramics, so it's not ideal. Might have the same frequency stability, but probably won't really matter that much. If this doesn't do it, we'll have to tweak that uh, parallel capacitor. Let's see if that does the job. It may be this crystal's not really suited for that parallel capacitor. I'm not going to clean the flux off yet. Flux on oscillators does affect them, but I'm not going to do it until I finish playing with it. Okay, still good for connections. One point six three seven eight nine is going in the wrong direction. <laughs> I probably could lift those original capacitors in there. All right, let's find that parallel capacitor. Which one's that? Um, parallel capacitor is C52. And C52 is right next to the crystal. Okay. Like end on. Let's take that capacitor out. This blue one here. So I think I'll do is lift one leg or something. Seems we're experimenting. My find just doesn't like this crystal with that capacitor there. Come on. Probably should have pushed for fresh oil on this. Yeah, I'm gonna have to do that. It's not gonna pop out. It's going to be stubborn, isn't it? Here we go. All right. so there's now no parallel capacitor. Let's see what that does for it. Check connections. Doing all right. Hmm. One point six three eight eight. That hasn't helped at all. If I ground that, 
does basically nothing. Went down very slightly, I think. Well, this is interesting. I was expecting to see a bit more of a change from that. Right, well. What else can we do to tweak this frequency? full screen. So we took off that parallel capacitor, swap both of those to what's supposed to be there, kind of, and we're still quite a long way off. Let's think about this. Yeah, I'm thinking about C24 actually. I'm thinking about that one. Um, the original capacitor was smaller. I think it was 80 odd. I do know that if I put a serious capacitor on the crystal, it will allow it to be more loosely coupled which will allow it to oscillate more freely with a higher frequency so I do know that it's something which I may have to do if I need to change C23 again I'm not sure so C24 is that polystyrene capacitor which I replaced with the ceramic because that's what I've got so I might go to something like 68 puff See if that brings it up enough. I've never taken a crystal apart and played with it, never done that. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I will try reducing C24. Okay. Why should I go 56? I might go 56 actually, I think I might go to a bigger extreme. Right. Should swap this back over so you can see the other one. Back to that. Full screen net. Full screen net again. It takes two goes apparently. And that's on the wrong screen, so it's not the one you want. We want that one. So that's that big one I just put in just now, so obviously that's not suitable. Put that back out. Instead of doing these permanently, as I might just tack them on for the time being until I determine what you need to use. Good. 
Alright, so that's 1.63792. So it's definitely come up. It's going in the right direction. So that's on 56 picofarad. So if I get the one twenty, let's try this. It's the one twenty across the four seventy, and see if I can get a frequency shift. It's going downwards. Yeah, that's going on direction. So increasing C24 is actually dragging it down. But it's could be because I'm holding it as well, passing some of my fingers. Right. Seems this crystal is going to be stubborn. do that. I was thinking if I need to insert a serious capacitor with the crystal itself. But that would have been cutting the track. Don't really want to do that. So I'll stick this parallel capacitor back on again. Let's push it back into place. It's not changing by much. Okay. What's the best way of dealing with this? And you can't see the frequency because the chat window's over the top. I just realised that. That's stupid. Who did that? I moved up a little bit. Anyway, it's still being cut off. I think it is, isn't it? I can't see that properly. Uh, the scope has actually got a really accurate frequency on it. I probably compared that, and that's actually pretty close. Showing measurements, okay, cool. We yeah, so at the very top of the window, it should be there. Let me just fix this bloody. Um, what's it cropping the top of the window off? That's annoying. Let's fix that. It's not cropping it. Apparently. It definitely is. That's weird. Hmm. Oh, that's where it is. It's over there. Right. Here you go. Pay more attention to that, shouldn't I? 
So there you go, Springs is now top right end of that window there. Yeah, it's on, a, it's on the bottom anyway, but that measurement at the bottom is from the waveform measurement. The frequency at the top right hand corner there is the actual hardware frequency counter. So that's a bit more reliable for measuring frequency. Which is why I'm trying to get that on screen. Um, so if I go back to here, you still can't see it because the chat window is over it. <laughs> Uh, this is annoying. <laughs> See, there's that there. There's the hardware frequency counter. Um, let me just play with this. Hold on a second. This is going to bug me if I don't do something about it. We'll get there eventually. Uh, here we go. It's kind of there now. Let's cut this out. Oh, actually, I might leave the pole in there. That might be handy to see. There you go. I might leave it in there. That works. Ah, dear. Oh, this will be right next time. <laughs> okay. I mean, what error are we talking about here, anyway, for that frequency? It's basically 1.6384. Is it 84 or 04? Oh, I've forgotten again. Turn it on. Uh, 32768 times 50. 1.6384. Hmm. Minus one six three seven nine two five. Let's call that. It's four hundred seventy five hertz off. And that frequency, which is divided down by fifty, so it's like one hertz. One. Yeah, it's only very slightly off, isn't it? It's less than one hertz per cycle. Yeah, I want to get closer now. I know. Okay, let's do Well, it's purely for timing with the um, AC mains frequency, right? So the more accurate it is, the less erratic the display will be with induced AC noise right so line noise so I mean it's one hurt out so it's n it's not that bad if it was half a hertz out I'd be happier so let's change our frequency a bit more and we'll swap that to 56 picofarad capacitor what if I should reduce the other one a little bit more oh, I don't know no I saw that 56 out I'll swap it down to something else maybe a 33 I'll see if it's still oscillates Here 
point of view, so you can see what the hell I'm doing. Also, the long capacity leads won't be helping this, but it's only temporary. Not oscillating, so it's obviously too low capacitance. If I stick the parallel capacitor back on again, it'll probably make it worse actually. <laughs> Let's hold that on. Yeah, okay, so 33 is too low, one oscillate with 33. So I think 56 is probably as low as I should probably go with it. What I might do is put that original... Um, I think I'll leave it. No, I think I'll put that 3331 back in again, the original ceramic that was in that first spot, which I put the 470 in. I might put the original 331 back in there. So 330 big for it. And just try and reduce the circuit loading. I knew this would be interesting. That's why I was thought I'd do it on the live stream. Oh, certainly a stubborn one to work on. Since I've got a lot of heat out this one. And that has not cleared the holes. So one one's clear, the other one's not. Because that's the big ground plane in the back of it. Original 331 back in again, so that's the original part. Extractor fan going. Put the fifty six back in. These holes out while I think up, shouldn't I? Right. Let's recheck that. Alright, so it's 1.63934. So that came up by 10 hertz. 
Mm -hmm, 10 hertz. Um, it's still a long way off. So putting a smaller capacitor in C24 has helped to raise the frequency a little bit. We've also got 100p effort across there. That drops it down. So I should just take that one back out completely. That 100p peak forward. Take that out. Because it's only making the problem much worse. So, let's retest that now, it doesn't get that hanging off the rail as well, because it was hanging off the crystal. Yeah, 3.5. Okay. So we're getting closer. I'm not there yet though, but, yeah. Is there anything else we can do to this? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I already lifted that parallel cap. Already done that. Chris, already done that. Okay, Dave. Goodbye. You're probably already gone. Uh, okay. So we're still down a little bit in frequency. Really want to get it closer. I might have to put a serious capacitor on that crystal to bring that up. wondering about R51 actually if I reduce the value of R51 is that going to help it I wonder okay thanks for dropping by so yeah it's possible to get a different crystal I did that did cross my mind to swap it out for a different crystal like one that does work a little, a little bit better let's do that next year it's only two bloody leads I'd rather do that than risk cutting tracks and doing you know bodges like that I mean I will have to do that maybe um, obviously these are designed for different uh, oscillator loading so let's do this it could all be they're all off value maybe that's why they were for sale online I don't know maybe there's a rejects kill that first obviously Easier the second time around. I think I'll tack this one in. Nah, let's do it properly.
And if I did need to cut a track, I'm trying to see where I'd have to do it. wire tied up the way. Connection's good, try that one. 1.637926. It's worse than the last one. Might change when it cools down though. 28, yes, yeah, drifting up it looks like. Yeah, it's drifting upwards. So, no better, no worse. Can I stick a sewers capacitor on this thing? Where does that track go? I don't know, it disappears. See, if I can see the circuitry here, I might be able to see a way of doing this. So he has a serious capacitor. Oh, no, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Oh, I need a torch to shine through this. Let's get on with this thing. This seems a bit weird. Expecting to see. Oh, right, because the link's on that side. Okay. Where's the other side go? I should have looked at that before I put the thing back down again. It's R51. The frequency may shift a little bit when I install it, but it won't shift upwards, it'll only shift downwards because of the capacitive effects loading it down. It's if it changes at all. Um, it's not changing much, it's actually looking pretty solid actually, it's not looking very touchy at all, it's not really got a lot of drift going on there. So, 
It's actually looking like a quite a rock solid Oslo, really. What's the ball from? Okay, it's a uh, digital ball from the Datron 1082 seven and a half digit multimeter. I'm trying to change the oscillator to suit the line frequency because it did have a well, it came from a 60 hertz line frequency country, and it uses this crystal oscillator here. And I've swapped the crystal, but now I'm trying to get the frequency right because the frequency is wrong. It's sitting too low. If I change this to R51, hmm. What's that on there? We might just try paralleling, putting a resistor in parallel with R51. They might be the wrong direction. I might need to actually reduce the coupling. Um, too fast. Go on. Slower. Go slower. All right. I'm looking at the, this end of the crystal being tied to ground. If I change that coupling, it may adjust the frequency of the crystal because that affects the whole oscillator. All right, so I may need to pull it down more or go higher. I'm not quite sure which direction I've got going. Um, but I'll try changing that and we'll see if that helps. Yeah, we'll give that a go. I'll just stick something across there first, see if it changes it much. And if it does change, which direction it goes in. Uh, right. Let's get, say, oh, I a substitution box that might affect the oscillator though. Too much capacitance, so let's just try a small alteration. Let's put the 200 ohm across it. That will drag it down a little bit. So, as a refresher. Power on. We're getting 1.63921 currently. Six three nine two one. This is the. Let's drop down. So my thought about making that coupling less from that resistor might be the right track to go on. I just want to get as close as I can. I mean, if I even if I don't get it perfect, you know, I just want to get as close as I can to the value I want. So let's take that resistor out. Sort it for the one I've just got.
Sure. Let's stick this one in. I think I'm just wedge it in those holes that might work actually. Let's try that. Yeah, 1.637928. Do most of it. Let's try this. Let's go with one K. Got heaps of one K. It's a big change. Might be too little. Get in trouble getting a good connection as well. So one K might be too little. Well, too great a value. So okay, can't go that far. Thirty. 50% more than the last one which did work. It's not looking very clean, is it? Lots of jitter, it's only barely working, I think. Things did come up a little bit, but it's not really working, so that's not a good value. So I think 220, was it 200? I don't know which one it was, anyway. That's looking alright. So I think I might just go with that one. A pain having to modify the circuit so much. Anyway, kind of what I was expecting to have to do. I actually think now the crystal was slightly better. I might swap that back out. I think it was slightly higher frequency. The other crystal I think was slightly better. I'll put the other one back in.
Okay. Yeah, so this is slightly higher. So it's 941 and it's creeping upwards. So this is sort of about 20 higher. And if I ground the casing. Drops a little bit, I think. Marginal. Yeah, I'm still a long way from where I want it to be, though. Yeah. Oh, what well, might be what it is. Since these crystal films aren't the best, I don't really see as much more I can do to make this better. Uh, okay, right. Sky picture seems stuck. Does it? Let me check. Oh, it is stuck. Seems that browser's completely frozen up actually. Let's quit that browser and we launch it. There we go. I mean, that was interesting, wasn't it? Look at this. Here we go, fixed. What did someone tell me? Um, yeah, my phone's not in here, so my Discord message wouldn't come through to me because my phone's in the other room. <laughs> oh, I don't know. There you go, view. yes. Anyway, so the frequency is now higher with this crystal. Not a lot in it. You tried, yes, yes, you tried. I mean, I've only made a marginal difference. It's only up by like 30 hertz, isn't it? It's not a big difference I've made. Still got to go up by another 350. <laughs> Mobile number. No, no, I'm not going to give that out. <laughs> only a very few people have got that number. Um, yeah. Okay. That's still far off from where I wanted to be. Shall I try a serious capacitor? This is like the last thing really I could do. Do is I'll pop off one side, pop that out. And I'll spin it around. I should just dissolve the whole parts from my. easier. So spin that around. That. Right. 
Je m'en sors de pas grand. So let's shove. It needs to be fairly loose coupling, I think. Let's try 120p. Pick a throw first, since we've got one sitting here like that. Closer, so that's 1.63804. It's coming up by 100 hertz. Best gain yet. Should have done it straight away, shouldn't I? I didn't want to cut the track, though, that's the problem. And I, and I, so I'm kind of reluctant to do that. Uh, what's that on there? It's a 30. It's a 47. Might be too low. Lost lane, that's a good start. Hmm. It's got down in frequency, not up. That's interesting. 1.637974. But it is warm. But I will expect to see it drifting mm. as it cools down. So it looks like the 120 was doing a better job. Interesting. Come on, this over. Got one hundred sitting over here. Should have just twice much, shouldn't I? We do 100s. Bear in mind with temperature, the things you may drift, but oh, my scope's gone to sleep. Wake up. I say so. 100 pika farad is doing. 1.63808 Hey, you can even see it on screen still. The scope disappears because I uh, turned the power supply on off to kill the power to the board. Okay, so that's not bad. That's only 300 hertz down. 220 hmm interesting I wonder why that bloody ceramic cap I tried just now at 56 no oh, secret engineer you got blocked for some reason anyway I'll show it um, Yeah, that stick away exactly. I'm, I'm pretty really close. Really close. I'm just being really fussy. So, well, look, now it's even better than that. Can I improve upon this some more? What do you reckon? Let's try another capacitor. I'm just puzzled why that ceramic one didn't give the value I expected it to do. Anyway, let's try a let's do a 68. Let's 
Benchmark 68 instead. Long lead, which might affect the reading, but it doesn't seem to be too touchy about dirt on the board and lead length in the situation. It's not like when I've been working on CB oscillators, they're really touchy because the high frequency, you know, they're 10 times higher than this and stuff I'm playing with, so they're much more touchy. This has been a bit more tolerant. Look at that, a bit more 1.63811. Seven. Okay. Less than 300 away. Right. So I'm really puzzled about that. Did I put the wrong one in? Did I put in a 471 instead of 47? That explains why it didn't really make sense. I think I did. I think I was an idiot. Here's a 30. I think it's a 30. Yes, 30. Come on, attach. Still not sliding, that's good. 1.6383. I'm actually amazed it's still oscillating. <laughs> that is really close now. Oh, 296 is it's dropping slightly. As it's cooling down, it's changing. But it's still really close. This one over here is a 56. Now, when I went lower previously, it wasn't happy. But I've made some changes since then. It might allow me to go lower now. And this will affect the frequency a bit. Uh, let's try a 47. It's not a big change, but it might be enough. I don't know if I have too much of a decoupling on the actual crystal itself, that series capacitor. I don't like going too low. But the feedback ones can probably be a bit less. I know I'm really being, being really fussy about this thing. Not oscillating. Yeah, okay. That was no good. So, that's a small change and it killed it. So, even 56 is pushing it, I think. I mean, that's a small difference in capacitance and that killed it. Um, that makes me a bit worried about 56 being a bit close. Okay, so I've got to a 68. So I've sacrificed a little bit of frequency for that. 
but I think it's going to be a bit more reliable as far as um, risk of the oscillator not starting. So that seems good. Let's put that one in properly. I think I'm happy with that one. Just fell off from one side. <laughs> Who was the original capacitors there? What was that one? Um, that didn't go right through the ball, did it? No, it didn't. The original polystyrene capacitor is an 82. Shall I put the original polystyrene back in again? really tempted to actually. Just to take it on and see how it goes. It's the lost lighting and only a small sacrifice in frequency for the original part to still be in there. So I might leave the original part in. So I've basically come first full circle to what I was originally going to do, which was to just have a serious capacitor. <laughs> Uh, right, let's get his leads in properly. Change this coupling one again from the crystal. So, unfortunately, it does look like I'm going to have to cut the trace in order to reduce that. I'm at the point now where I could actually put a trimmer in. Has the scope gone again? No? I don't know. Yeah, well I think you find a reason to do it in the first place, yes indeed. Um, so now I'm down to sort of, that's like 30, yeah, 30 picofarad. So I could put a trimmer in. And then make it adjustable and see how that goes. That's possible. If I can remember where they were. <laughs> oh, there we go. Right. Uh, which one's which? 
green, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just trying to see which strain you want to eat on. Yellow is 6.8 to 40, so let's do yellow. Oh, should I go? Oh, I might do green, which is 2.8 to 30. Actually, I've got loads of those. I've got loads of green ones. Means it'll be a lower range. It won't be as good as the other one, but. Might overlap the one I just took out. Still, what do we get? Still oscillating. Six zero eight two oh five. So that's obviously a high capacity. That's interesting. Right. This is a metal screwdriver. Two nine one. Six zero eight four four, and it's still oscillating. Best things we want. Sucking so just good. Let's get a ceramic. It froze on screen. That's no, still going. Cool. All right. Let's see if it cuts out. 6386, 6387, 6388, 6389. 639. There we go, that's the peak. So that's about 2.8, 3 peak of ferret there. At its last frequency, and it's still oscillating. Right, will it start? No, it won't start. Okay. Let's wind this down until it starts. Starts there, so it's really marginal, All right? So it's six three eight six. All right. What capacitance is that? This is about 12 picofarad. Let's put these together. It's not really helping. You know, look, it's just about 12 pf. 10 there, getting about 10 on that. Okay. Yeah, I believe that's about right. That's pretty loose coupling. So if I stick in something like 20, 
Mm. I don't know, that 38 before was really close. 27. I don't want to put a trimmer in there because the trimmers can be a bit dodgy, they can get noisy and stuff, so. 27. I think there might be a good compromise. And I think also you put the crystal in and cut a track. I don't really want to cut a track, but I'm going to have to do it in order to get this frequency right. This is 27. Yeah, 6383. I had a 30 before, which is basically the same, so. Yeah. It's still got that nice peak on that waveform as well. It's got that higher peak. Whereas when it's starting to fail, it's starting to round off. So I'm fairly sure it's okay there. Right, chit chat. One's eating. Oh, I could use some food actually. I'm a bit hungry. My wife's not here. She's out again. She's at another meeting. So I've got no one to tend to my needs. No foods. No coffees. Okay, an honest repair, thanks for dropping by. Catch you next time. So yeah, that seems to be working okay there. And it's only 100 hertz down. So when you divide that down by 50, two, so, Yeah, I think it's pretty good. Yeah, I've, um, I'm currently running on the original frequency, on the original value. So this had the, um, let's drop out of that. So C24, let's change screens as well. Um, what was that one? That was 82 picofarad, right? So when I had the 1.9 megahertz crystal in here, they had an 82 picofarad here and a 330 picofarad here. Right? And to change this crystal for the Datron manual, it says to change the crystal, we have to put these values in, which are on here, right? So Accuracy value with these capacitors. Fine. So, what I've ended up doing now is going back to the original values, the original parts that are in that on that ball. So, it's back to the original 82 picofarad here and back to the original 330 picofarad here. So, that's the original parts which came from the factory. And all I've actually done now is effectively put in a series capacitor with that crystal. Uh, what did Ian say? I didn't see Ian. Oh, I typed over right. Um, so yeah, so that's what I'm basically tinkering with now is reducing the actual series capacitance of the crystal in order to get a frequency right. So my guess would be that this crystal was based on a serious capacitance of 10 pf. Hmm. Might be 20 pf actually. Probably 20 peak of ferret. Maybe. Anyway, it's working. It seems to be starting fine. I don't like taking things right to the edge of the point where they don't start anymore. So. I'm 
hoping that this will be okay. But it's still really, really close. You know, it's not as close as I wanted, but I think it's going to be good enough. We need two cycles out of 50 hertz, so that's not bad, really. I reckon it'd be close enough. Right, 50 hertz down, uh, two, two hertz out off that clock frequency. Crystals off eBay, but that's the only ones I could find. So, although I do have another option, I did get approached for sponsorship by a manufacturer. So if I hadn't been able to find these crystals, then I would have actually gone to the manufacturer and said, I want some made, and I want this frequency. But then you need to know, right, what are the loading specs, you know, what's the parallel capacitance, series capacitance specs for the crystal, so you know the actual frequency tuning, right? So, line frequency is not exactly 50 hertz anyway, yeah, that's true. It varies up and down a little bit. But obviously it's supposed to be 50 hertz plus or minus a little bit so I'm trying to get that center point I mean I know I'm just being fussy you know so I think my accuracy now is good enough I think it's good enough I mean that's 100 hertz down at that frequency so if you look at the clock divider, you know it's not much of a difference in clock divider. I mean, it's going to be basically the same point on the waveform all the time. So if I work this out, um, if I can't remember to put this out, um, hit three. That's 49.996 hertz light frequency, right? Well, 997, call it, because it's rounding and stuff. So, I actually think I'm probably being way too fussy. Alright, so here's my other calculator. I this one for years. Original battery. So, there's the line frequency based on the frequency of that clock right now in order to get a consistent timing. I reckon that's good enough. It's not 50, though. No. It's not nice round number 50. Yeah. I reckon I'll just make this work. Cool. Right. Let's put this thing back together. Resort of crystal. I'm going to have to cut a track. I don't really want to do that. I can't see any way of modifying the circuitry around there. I don't think. I'll pull the whole crystal out and see if there's a way I can actually maybe break a link somewhere or something. Um, I might be able to do something. It's very close, yes. Um, let's change views again. Let's do that one. I did that and it still turned on, didn't I? I'm an idiot. That's stupid. It's all isolated anyway, so it should be okay. Should have survived it. 
now I've lost a plastic spacer. There's one. Where's the other one? There it is. So that comes through here, through there, straight down to the leg of that. Yeah, so I was hoping to be like a link or something I could potentially change to get a serious capacitance there. But unfortunately not. I'm going to have to cut a track. No way of avoiding it, unfortunately. Now as that little ground tag thing on the top of the casing isn't having much of an effect, I probably will attach that to a, a pad on the board. I'll pour some which aren't even used. I might be able to use one of them maybe if I can see which ones aren't actually used. And um, just use it as an anchor point just to create some more stability. We'll see about that. So I've got to cut a track. I don't want to but I'm gonna have to. Dead, that's what it's supposed to be. And I want the 27. That's the 30. That's the 471. 27.
pick it up. That works. Okay, we've got oscillation. I think this drops a little bit, but yeah. Okay, 1.63827. Not too bad. I think I can live with it. So let's clean this up. Getting the flux off might actually help it a little bit as well. Then I'll actually tack down this capacitor as well, so it doesn't move around. So you just hang off the bottom of the ball. From doing the CB work sort of thing, I do know that having flux left on the board and oscillator circuits can cause issues with loading down of the oscillator and stuff like that. So I'm definitely very fussy about removing any flux from oscillator sections. Just by just check the outside of the board as well, make sure it's looking okay. That's right, this is from the fact that I was soldering on the side as well. That looks right though. Now we've got this anchor point thing. Is there a bare pad I can attach it to so it's not actually doing anything? It's ground anchors, there's a pad there which is used, those are used. Those. Don't appear to be used actually. I might better use that one. I think I found a pad which isn't going to do anything. So this optional circuitry which has been removed. Yep, nothing there. And nothing there. I think. Yeah, there's only two layer boards. I'm pretty sure there's no third layer in the middle of them, really. Uh, so it goes to there. It goes to that pad there. Okay, I think I found a pad which isn't connected to anything, so I can use it as an anchor point. No, I'll turn you on after my thinking I was finished. No, 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 not finished yet. I'm actually tempted to spin this around.
Okay, I think we're done. The oscillating 1.638276. Two seven eight, two seven nine, two eighty. Because the, the crystal housing is cooling down, so the frequency is going up. So we're good. I've got a bunch of tidying up to do. <laughs> Check, we'll put the ball back in. One six three seven nine seven three, yeah. Yeah, cat is one of my attention. The uh, stepson hasn't got up to feed them yet. He obviously had a late night gaming or something. Right. Let's get this thing back together. I don't like this whole battery thing, but yeah. It's a good battery. It's measuring fine. It's actually got a higher capacity battery I'll be putting in. So it's probably got another five, ten years in it yet. So I'm not going to worry about changing it. Even though it's not an ideal situation. Oh, I think the stepson's up. The hood plates. The cats might be solved. Yep, stepson's up. It's feeding the cats. Yay. I guess he got sick of the meowing. Hopefully I've done something like short out the battery or you know, lose a little calibration from the constants. Though like I said, it's not a total disaster if it does because I'll just redo it. See if I answer having the Datron calibrator. If something goes wrong, we'll just fix it. Something I do have, which is something I was actually very tempted to do for the live stream, is my Valhalla 2703, the AC calibrator, which has got some kind of weird fault. The calibration was out a little bit. And I went to recalibrate it, and um, 
really, really messed it up. <laughs> it's as though the digital signals aren't right inside it. I did notice some weird stepping on it when I was actually using it, so I'm thinking that's probably related. Maybe it's the weird stepping which has messed up the calibration. So that's something I need to get into. I think I need to actually do some logic analyzer work on that. Hook up to that with logic analyzer and actually check all the digital signals to make sure they're stepping like they should be. And that kind of stuff. So I think that's going to be quite involved. So I don't know if I'll do that on a live stream or not, because I think I'm going to have to have a lot of concentration on that particular beast. So um, I'll probably start to get the laptop out with a with my um, Zero Plus logic analyzer because that's got lots of channels on it. I don't think 16 channels or 8 channels would be enough. Right. Check them, make sure I've missed any. Um, reattach a battery to the side wall with my tape and <laughs> my oh, no, drop it down a bit hard. Um, bit of this stuff, reattach that. This is a BCX72 3.9 volt lithium cell, apparently. It's measuring 3.7 something. Maybe it isn't that good after all of this. Hmm. Let me recheck that actually. Three point six nine. Yeah, still the life of me. Don't worry about it. Right, let's power this thing back up again. See if it still works. After all that messing around, probably finally killed it. <laughs> IP0? What the hell's IP0 mean? Hmm. No idea. Um, did I miss something, have I? Don't think so. Let's put a source into it and see if it still works. DC volts here, auto range it. Looks like it's working. So zero volts, one volt. Yeah, it's there. It's working. Ten volts should be close. Nine volts. Hmm. Zero volts. One. Do I do that too fast and cause this to go out of sequence? Nine volts. Ten volts. Yeah. Ian, I think I was glitched your PDV is too many. <laughs> that was weird. Okay. If he's even here, he might not be gone by now. Oh no, he's still there. Um, anyway, so 10 volts are working. Let me shove it this way a little bit and stick another digit on. How's that sound? Uh, what button I'm looking for? High res. Here we go. Hey Kim, how's it going? Good to see you here. What time is it there, Kim? Hey, buddy. Oh, my cat's all in. She's obviously been fed. She's licking her lips. She's all happy.
No such bug. <laughs> Ian, you saw it do it just now. <laughs> I was pushing the buttons too quickly. I got, got a sync somehow. I was doing it really quickly. So, let's see if I can do it again. There you go. Now I'm getting 5 volts, 10 volts setting. Oh no, there we go. Oh, sorry, because I've got a high res on now. It's going to make me do stuff wrong. High res is like an averaging thing. So I'm going to do it again. I want to replicate this now. Oh, it's going to prove me wrong. There we go. 9 volts. 10 volt setting. It is possible to glitch it if you push the button really, really quickly. <laughs> it's obviously just a timing thing as a switching ranges. If I do it slow, it's fine. It's only got to do it really quick. One thirty-three a.m. Wow. Is it a late start or is it an early start? That's the question. When you get into that time of day. <laughs> Anyway, for those of you who aren't familiar with this unit, well, I imagine most of you are. Ian Johnson's PDV is too many. Like, Ian Johnson's in the chat. He makes these things. Excellent little device. Really handy little reference. Really convenient thing to have around because it's really quick and easy to grab it and just plug it in and do verification and stuff with it. It's an excellent thing. Highly recommended. Go buy one. Put another meter on it. You're doubting it. You're doubting me. <laughs> okay, I'll try and glitch it again. Done it twice now, Ian. I've repeated it. I'm good at breaking things like that. That is okay that time. It's okay that time. Okay, that time. Oh, come on. I need to glitch it so I can prove it. Okay, that time. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. Even saw we do it. I need to do it again now to prove it, don't I? Good where these buttons are trying to do this now. I definitely glitched it in. It definitely happened. But you obviously reckon it's the multimeter is glitching. Which is a fair thing to prove, I suppose. So I want to glitch it again. No. Could be your day, doing this. Oh, come on. <laughs> no, I can't repeat it. I repeated it once. I might have to give up. <laughs> uh. Yeah, if I could glitch it again, then I um, then I could prove it either way. For like four hundred streams, you get to glitch. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's it's not going to glitch now. <laughs> It's only because I was doing it really fast. I mean, that's the first time I've seen it do that. 
So, but then I repeated it. So I don't know. I'd be surprised if multimeter. But uh, I don't know. It's possible. But at least the meter's working. Try something else when I think about it. So I changed that crystal, and in theory, it should have made it quieter and a less noisy display, right? So when I had that 60 hertz crystal in there, I'd see that last digit changing by you know one or two counts. So this is the filter on high res high res mode. And we're still seeing it changing. If anything, it might be worse. I was watching those counts. You know what? I'm actually thinking that 60 hertz crystal is better. <laughs> it might be different once it's all warmed up, though. You know, it's all, everything's cold, so who knows? OCD Scott, yes. Just the touch. I can't glitch it now. I don't know why it's a good thing. Anyway, it still works. Let's put the thing back together. <laughs> oh, I've got to put the clips back on first. If I stick my hands because there's high voltage over the place in this thing. I was actually commenting before about how stable that 60 hertz crystal was because it seemed like it was actually really good. So, um, oh, wait, I can't put it back together yet. I haven't done new prompts. Could it be the Dantron oscillator stopping? 
Possibly, but if it stops, I don't think it'll restart again. Johnny had the same problem last time, Johnny, as well, with your server dropping down and coming back up again. Maybe you mentioned that before. All right, let's get these um, EPROMs out of this thing. I'm always nervous about taking EPROMs out of things. I think I can in before it drives me nuts and knock on the cat flat. just came in as the um, one which you haven't seen yet, it's a black and white cat. Uh, yeah, this is the plane buzzing around outside. So, like I was saying, um, I'm always nervous about taking EPROMs out because there's always a risk of um, breaking a pen off or damaging a trace in a circuit board or something. Sometimes they are quite well anchored down. Just trying to get my EPROM programmer set up here. And the port I normally use has got a camera plugged into it. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Let's use one of these USB 3 ports, hopefully, it still works. I can almost get it in shot, it's just like, there it is. Can't get it in shot and at the same time it's got it plugged in my computer, so I'm gonna have to change where I'm based. Oh, it's got software running. Sometimes it crashes like crazy and I won't be able to use it anyway. We'll see. EPROMs, I need to set this for the right EPROM. Uh, come on. It's 2732s. What exactly are these things? MM two seven C three two Q It's fine exactly the right device. MM two seven C. No, I don't have an MM two seven C. No MMs whatsoever. Okay. Oh generic two seven C would Probably do that generic device 27C32. Let's look for a generic one NM27C. Is it NM, not an M? It is an NM. All right, 27C32C32QE45. Okay, QE. QE. Don't have a QE. Uh, I'll just do 32. 45 timing. Okay. Probably not too critical for reading anyway. Alright. So I need to find as well as the same page. Actually, I know which page it is. For the actual device numbering. Power is off, yes. Let's turn my scope off actually. Finish with that now. Let's get these things out. First device. Uh, let's 
get the manual for this again. I want the last page because it shows me the numbering of the devices. So let's go to this. Um, shut that off now, yeah, I can go. So this is M18 I've just pulled out. So let's read this device. I'll check this up here. Here we go. Or well, maybe I won't. <laughs> oh, look now, I've broken it. <laughs> oh, come on. Yeah, I'll reboot. Oh, no, no, oh, it's half there. No, I've, no, I've crashed it. So you won't be able to see it because it's going to crash with Windows. It's like I said, it's dodgy software. Right, so I can't put this into a window where you can see what I'm doing. I could try it again. I'll try one more time. If it doesn't work, then I'll, I'm going to give up on that. All right. Oh, look, there it is. Gone. <laughs> Uh, where's the button? Oh, uh, I hate those hints things. Come on. No, nah, it's like. No, nah, no good. Okay, so this is the right button. So let's make sure that I'm on the right chip. Put this back up here. Lost everything again. All right, so it's mouse over. That's the device I'm going to use. I want the one which reads it in, which is this button here. There we go, read the chip. You can't read it, you can't see it, but it's there. There we go, oh, it's back. <laughs> this is awesome software. So, let's save this somewhere before I lose it. All right, this is M18. Which is uh, 290120 hyphen 220, I think, which is decode 0605 Come on. I'm surprised it's 220, is it right? Was it 22.0? Or 220, it might be. Hmm. I'm going to call it 220. Because the other ones have got A's and stuff, so I'm going to call it O, not 0. Ah, crap. The software is so buggy, it does all sorts of weird shit. It just completely renamed that. 290-120-22-0. Right. What did I say that as? That's a good question. I forgot to check what file format it was. Where is it? There. Okay. File type was all files, apparently. That's helpful. Let's save as a bin. And save it as a hex. I always save it as two formats.
tedious, I know. Anyway, that's one EPROM backed up. <laughs> Software could be so much easier, anyway. Um, I need to do a new folder first. Hold on. My two EPROMs. There's one there, one there. Okay. Now do the next one. You need to do is we'll put this thing back together and put it back in the stack. So that's why I'm doing it now. So next two prompt is same type. I better double check. They should be. They, they don't tend to swap those out. Yep, same type. Let's read that again. And this chip is the M30 chip here. Save that. I mean, it's not too exciting for you guys to see what I'm doing. I'm afraid you can't really see a lot because of the bloody programmer software being the programmer software. Um, So it was M30, wasn't it? M30. Firmware number is 119. 2901192.0, which I'm guessing is an O. Same date code. First one saved. Gets a bit easy once you get the first one's done. I'll save that as a now save as a hex, and we'll save as a bin. Uh, I really wish the software was better. <laughs> but hey, it works on a Mac. That's the main thing. So, yay. Two palms down. Next one. Chat, chat. You ain't seen it yet, yeah, I know. I can't get that window in the top screen. It makes it black out. Is there an alternative for software? Nope. <laughs> the light on you problem was working. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. As in the die inside the window. <laughs> oh, that's a good one here. <laughs> Actually, remember that when I was first multimeters I did the um, one of one six twos. The EPROM for the um, cheap by people was in backwards. Do you remember that? I don't know if you guys saw that or not, but the EPROM was actually installed backwards on the GPO people. There's a few chips I found backwards in that particular unit, which is quite interesting. I found a few chips in wrong. So I'm unplugging things and plugging things backwards for the sake of it, I don't know. Right, this is M35. This is one that's went up here again. Right, so there's the window. There you go. Gone. <laughs> right, let's read it. Come here. Read it. That one there. Well, see, I'm going to try and do it in this window, see if it works. Post is finished. Come on, show me the window. There you go. Right, there it is. And the save as dialog. Save as dialog pops up in the bottom monitor. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So I'm going to grab that file name. This is what not? Uh, what's that part? In thirty-five. M35. 
and the part is uh, 118. Same as the bin. Okay, we'll save it again. As again, the actual dialogues pop up in a different screen. <laughs> like the, the menu. It then now sits in the menu up here, it's coming out on the other screen. Weird. Right, 35. This time I'll save as a hex. Oh, come on. I need to see that. Oh, come on. <laughs> This software is awesome, isn't it? Look at that. It's, can't see the window. It's like... Put it back down here. Now I can see it. Hex. Hex. Okay. Three prompts done. One more to go. Over. This is RC problems off the GPIB board. Tighter in the socket, a bit more effort to get it out. Being really gentle with it. Okay. So this is the GPIB board one, and the chip should be the same. This is a two. Oh, this is a two five. This one, it's not the same. Okay. So I might need my data for this. this is a two five L three two JL. So, I can't plug that on straight in. I need my adapter for that. Where did I put it? Like most things, it's probably stuffed on, on my desk somewhere, but I don't see it. Got any problem. Dead one. That's one which is installed backwards in the GPO either, in the unit. Okay, I need to find my adapter. So I can then plug this in and read it. It's probably in my box up there. Okay, give me a minute. I need to get this adapter. So the two five three twos are different to the two seven three twos. They've got a different pin out. There's three pins which are different. And I did actually cover this in a previous video when I was working on one of the 1062s because they used 2532 EPROMs in the early versions and they're no longer available so they're no longer done like that. They now use these adapter boards or adapter modules. Well, module is it? It's more of a, a socket. So the digital board has got these sockets built into the sockets that actually adapt it from a 2532 footprint to a 2732 device. Here it is. So here's my adapter in here. I just made one. It's easy. Easy to make one. So if you haven't seen this before, what it basically is. is two sockets that are piggybacked, right? So I've got two really cheap ass pin sockets. Actually, I think these ones are oh, no, cheap, actually. <laughs> now you've got two different types. You've got a metal wrapped pin. Like, oh, come on, focus on this. Come on, here we go. So I've got the pins, round pin type at the bottom, which is a better one. I hate this camera for this focusing stuff. And I've got a cheaper one on the top, right? And that's just got pins which are folded out the side. 
So the reason I use this cheaper one on the top is because it's got pins which you can fold out because they're flat pins. And I fold out the side and I've done some wire links on the side to basically relink those footprints. Um, I don't know if I can get the camera. There you go. See it for a moment. So that does rewiring between a 2532 and a 2732. So all I've got to do on a program is tell it it's got a 2732, even though it's a 2532, and it will treat it as a 2732. Right, got that. Which means I can then read it. So I'll drop that in the footprint here, drop, the, oh, drop that in the EEPROM programmer. And we shall bring it up here. Find the thing, come on, where is it? Is it somewhere? Read. Okay, it's read it. There it is. So I've got to remember what this um, part number is. A power down your server so you can read like okay, UPS. Oh, right. So I need to find out what this IC part number is because I need to make sure I label it correctly. If it's not off this board, it's off the GPIB board, which I've got to find. And you can't see what I'm doing anyway. There you go. That's alright. Oh, no, I completely messed up now. Not that. Must have been the right window. What's happened to that? That's looking weird. Why's my top screen looking weird? Strange. Okay. Maybe I'll just design. <laughs> Possible. Right. That's display board. Okay, where is it? Oh, where's GPO people? Isn't it in this manual? Where's the display ball? Don't go past it. I don't know what I'm doing. There it is. M3. That's right. M3. I did go past it. Okay. M3 is the part number for that. So. Safe and dollars come down the bottom of the window again. Awesome. So I can do this up here. Here we go. There's a cursor. There it is. Ah dear. Oh, almost done, guys. <laughs> In three, and the part number is two ninety one two one. 21 interestingly and no trailing digit or anything and that code is different right Say this again as a binary. Pops up down here, which is fine because I need to do this bloody menu, otherwise I can't see it in the top screen because the software is awesome. Hey, but at least it works. I've got a software which works on Mac. It just isn't a very good software in that way. It's just not reliable, but there's so few choices. Okay. All written, all saved, EPROM's done. Yay! EPROM's backed up. Jamie, I have a John string. 
Oz, yes, to die, yes, John's gone live. Eh? Okay, thanks, Johnny. Kiss later. Okay, Kimmy. I don't even know you're there. Nice job, boy. So, that's it done. Everyone's backed up. I did something, did I? <laughs> right. Let's go back to that view there. Get this thing back off this. Don't think all. Okay. For the time being, I'll come back to that. Put it back in the right way up. It's kind of important. Excellent, finished. So it's interesting the way the meter actually seemed more noisy with the correct crystal than the one which was the incorrect crystal. It appears to be noisier. What's that flipping around? Oh, it's a key. So got a key stuck on the side and a bit of loop. Thought I'd left something floating around inside. Put the screws in, I'll test it because that way it's bound to be broken. So it works in it. It's not broken until you put the screws back in. In fact, that screw is one supposed to be underneath the label now, so I'll take that one back out. Or it's a bit ugly. Just label over the front of it. Anyway, right. This is what one is job done, which I've been meaning to get done. It's always nice getting jobs done. I'm just not convinced yet that uh, the crystal wasn't actually. Quieter, I'm not convinced yet. I'm sure it's actually slightly better with the 60 hertz, but I might change when it's all warmed up. Try and get this the in to the screw holes done, actually, might very well sometimes. Just loosen this up a bit and stick it on its front. So we didn't get to the solar tron. <laughs> Oh well, maybe I'll do it next week. What do you reckon? Maybe I'll investigate a little bit and decide what I'm going to do with the input. We're going to use the um, BNCs, not BNCs, use the banana jacks or the um, round connector, which I've got sitting over here. This is the socket for it over here. This is what I'm looking at potentially putting on. But it is smaller, it's not the same size, so I'm going to have to like shim it or something. I don't know. I did get some washers already on that one. One, one, one of them over there. I've got another. Maybe I've got another one. But I've got some washers already mounted. I'm thinking that might be what I need to mount it. But then, like I said, the problem I've got is then a um, actual cable which needs to go on it. I don't have any super wire. 
So, you know, I could make, I could put the converter on and put the plug on, but I've got no wire for it. So that'd be the problem. Anyway. Ouch, that hurt my finger. Ouch. It's going to be chunky out of it. Not just now, but on Friday I took a chunk out of my finger. That's a bit sore. Right. Power that up, power that on. So why does it come with IP0 now when I turn it on? Didn't used to do that. Have to figure that out. Not working. Still works. That's always good. to uh, pull this stuff back. So when I got this dash on, it was actually still sealed. It had the original calibration seal was still on it. Well, not the original, but it had calibration seal was still on it. So it hadn't been opened when I got it, and it's working. So this is refurbishing. Um, yeah, that's why I've left it intact as much as I can. Let's put this in. We built my stack over here. That's a farm of the bloody catcher is. <laughs> oh, where is it? There it is. Let's put this other thing away. I don't know. I don't know what the IP thing is when I turned it on. That's just interesting because I didn't remember seeing that before. Maybe I'll just run a self test on it. That only seems to have happened since I changed that crystal. So it does make you wonder a little bit. Um, let's change all these bloody buttons. Compared to 1062s, different places. Why can't I see self test? Hmm. There it is. If I can figure out how to get to it. No, it's not that. Ah, okay, let's put it on hold, then self-test. Right. So I'm trying to do a manual self-test in this thing. Error six, which I think is that it's in two it's in four wire. Then there are seven as well. Oh, I don't know. Anyway, then it says IP zero after that. What the hell is IP zero? I have to look it up. Faults, ohms passed. Then error seven. Then IP zero. Okay, I'll have to look into that. Okay. Let's put all this away again.
I know sometimes it's self test they give you weird errors if they if you don't have the switches in the right positions and stuff like that it's all um, a bit fussy Input zero memory error apparently. Okay, I'll go know what that is. <sighs> Fix the one input zero procedure. Oh, I will have to look at the manual. Maybe because of the frequency change, it's upset a timing, maybe. I was actually half thinking that, um, hey, Englishman's here. Okay. Watching from your hospital bed, what have you done? You haven't got the lurgy, have you? <laughs> Don't care if you have, honestly. But, yeah, I'm trying to be funny. So, yeah, it could be a timing thing where maybe it's affected the timing by changing a crystal. Maybe it's made a self check go out in some way. So, error seven is the other thing I need to look at. Kidneys, oh, okay. Wipe right, it sorts itself out, or is where it's required as it gets done. Okay, I'm just concentrating two things at once, and I don't do two things at once very well. I don't do two things at once well. Um, right. So these EPOMs I've uh, backed up, I will be making these available. I'll probably check on EV blog forum and um, k 44 bb and. Uh, what's the other one? I don't know. Whether I can put it, XDS will probably have it as well, I imagine. So I'll dump on a few places and share that. In case anybody else needs those EPROMs. I'll make some notes about them and stuff like that. The, um, I should take the pictures. I'm not opening up again. The, what was I going to do? Manual for the error messages. Error seven. Ah, oh, look at that. I'm glad I OCR'd this thing. I can't see where it's highlighting. Oh, there it is. Over here. Right. So, error seven is AC test failed. That's fine. I'll sort that out. <coughs> I think I saw this error before actually, but it seemed to be working fine, thinking about it. Yes, I couldn't actually fault it. It's giving an error, but everything seems to be working fine. I think it's actually the self-test circuitry which is giving the trouble there. Um, and there's the IP0. So, check for un uncorrupted input zero store. Right, so yes, good call, Al, uh, Al, Ian. Um, input zero store. Okay, fine. Oh, God, type it's got. find it really 
keep it zero. Look for that. Can't find it. Not that it fit manually, am I? Damn. Zero. Look for the word zero. Zero resistance source. Zero ring. I had done that calibration before. Input O. No, it's definitely zero. <laughs> it says zero, not O <laughs> this time. Okay. I did I do remember doing this calibration zero calibration thing when I did the adjustments on it before. Um Yeah, see this bit here. I went through this whole process and I did this. Um, what else is mentioned? I don't know, I can't see it. Realize. Come on, wish there's a more or less common phrase to find. Okay. Zero resistance source. Is that the problem? Don't know. I did all this though, so it should be right. Maybe I did um, temporarily short the battery or something. Maybe I did accidentally lose or corrupt the data. It wouldn't surprise me from all the blasting around I was doing. All the cow stuff, not looking at that. Well, how many times is zero? Turn up in this thing. It's like it's bloody everywhere. Non kind of non volatile calibration and zero memory, right? Master clock reference is mentioned in that page as well. Go on, some beat to it. <laughs> Considering this wasn't OCI before. Yeah, I think I might as well go through the zero calibrations again. I might have to recalibrate it. I thought I might have to add it to that crystal because I was expecting it to affect the timings and stuff and maybe affect the sampling and, and what have you. So, but it does look like it's got potentially. Um, lost or corrupted data from that. This is talking about zeroing stuff out. Yeah, that's the beginning again. So, no, oh well, I'll sort it later on. I'm not going to it now. Must go through each of the ranges to do a re zero and everything and see if that sorts it out. So, yes, we're good. So I passed 12. Very long stream, not bad. Um, yeah. I seem to do a soldering one as well. It's getting a bit long now. Getting a bit hungry. And thirsty.
Yeah, I remember watching that video, Ian, where you, um, you've you been sick and you mentioned about you know, just getting over it. You look, you look pretty sick in that video, actually. You didn't look like you were over it. You still look pretty ill at the time. It definitely uh, took a hit on you. Now, the wife's not here, Mako. She's, um, she's off at another meeting this weekend. She's had a lot of them recently. I think she's not. I think going on about a month's time, I think. But, um, yeah. For this committee, she's on. She's on this committee and she has to go to these meetings sometimes time to time. And there's been a little spate of them recently where she's having to go to a lot of these. So. They're discussing some stuff which is um, quite involved, so I know it requires a lot of discussion. So yeah, no sandwich service, no coffee. I have to fend for myself. Yeah, it's not good, is it? Alright, so I think I'll wrap this up. I'll tidy up, put my bits and pieces away. Put my stack back together and See, that's a pretty cool. I do like that. I think I'm just going to keep this as a coil, eh? I think it looks pretty good like that. Rather than stretching it all out, because I could unroll it and have it as, as a ribbon. But I think it looks better than like that. Big Clive at your heart, yeah. Yes, because it's, it's a two-day meeting they have, They because they try and get the most bang for buck out of the costs, because they've got, had to book hotel rooms, had to book a conference room, and that sort of stuff, and it, they can get it cheaper if they do it for a couple of days. So it just also gives them more time, because you get people travel to the meeting as well from over the country, so like normally my wife would have to fly down to like Wellington to do it, and so they do it over two days to give time for people to travel to it, so they can arrive during the first day, have like one whole day basically of meetings and then on the second day they will fly back halfway through you know so they only basically get two half days basically what they get so um that's why i do it over two days kids will find yeah well we've got five kids between us there's only one still here And his 20, you know, they're all grown up. Anyway. All right, so I'm going to cut this off, go and have another coffee because I'm really dying for a drink, have some lunch, and I'll come back and tidy up this mess I've left in here. And um, I might go through the calibration procedure on this thing and just try and do those re zeroings and. Um, See if it fixes that error in itself. I'll just zero, do all the zero points, and leave it at that, and see if it um, it still makes sense on the other readings. Out and to do a full recalibration, but it seemed to be basically reading correctly. The ten volts was basically right. You know, once it all warms up for an hour or two, it's it'll be right. So um, that's something I've noticed. The Datron stuff, the drift is actually pretty good on it. Like if I look at those multimeters, you turn them on, they, they're only drift marginally for the first 20 minutes or so and then after that it doesn't really drift much they're pretty good I do like that they, they, they've got um, discrete zinners as references and um, they work really well they're actually really really good references it seems they don't drift much at all once they're powered up anyway thanks for dropping by give us a thumbs up before you leave if you're not subscribed already I know most of you will be but anyone's watching isn't subscribed then subscribe now and I'll catch you on later um, yeah catch you later